Good morning. It's my privilege this morning to read from the Old Testament book of Genesis, uh, chapter 17, verses 1 to 7, and then 15 and 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to be your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her and moreover, I will give you a son by her I will bless her, and she shall rise to nations, kings of peoples shall come from her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, our second reading comes from Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it will profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. I can remember distinctly as a young person being around children who were being spoken to by a person in authority maybe a teacher, a parent. And I remember a child covering their ears and yelling, na, 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 so they could not hear what was being said to them. They had absolutely no desire to hear the truth. And if one of these was my brothers, my parents would march over to them and take their hands off their ears and speak boldly into their lives. On the schoolyard, it was another story. Today in our scriptures, we have a covenant, a promise of land and property that was a welcome word to Abraham and Sarah. They had had that promise made to them earlier when they were about 15 years younger, but no child had appeared, so they'd taken the matters into their own hands, and Sarai had given her handmaiden Hagar to Abraham, and a child had been born, Ishmael. They must have been very pleased to know that God was still going to bless them and give them land, but there was some stipulations according to God. And then in the New Testament passage this morning, we have a covenant of compassion and sacrifice that is not a welcome word to the disciples who are following Jesus. And in fact, Jesus is pulled away by Peter and told to stop saying such ridiculous things. 
in the vernacular of our day, Peter told Jesus to shut up. These are difficult passages for this season of Lent, but it is a place for us to set our feet on a firm foundation as we seek to be faithful in this day and struggle with the issues in our context. Will you join me in prayer? Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. So Jesus is on a divine mission to welcome and reconcile sinners, to fulfill each covenant revealed and then recorded in the Hebrew scriptures. And the gospel of Mark is very succinct, as we know, and to the point. And the section of scripture this morning that we are dwelling in begins in Mark chapter 8, verses 22 with the healing of the blind man of Bethsaida. And it ends with the healing of the blind Bartimaeus. Jesus wants to know if the disciples are, are, are going to be able to see what is really going on. Three times in these sections of passage, Jesus foretells, prophesies what is going to happen to him. And here again, uh, in chapter 8, and finally in chapter 9, verse 44, and then chapter 10, verses 25 to 41. And as soon as that prophecy is given, Holy Week begins, or Passover in those days. And for those disciples, following Jesus had been super exciting at first. For Jesus was charismatic. He was a star. He could cast out demons, raise people from the dead, heal the sick, mesmerize crowds with his teaching, and silence the Pharisees with a word. And the title Messiah begins to rise, and vision of a Davidic kingdom, great military victories, power, preeminence, authority, begin to take root in the disciples' hearts. They've hooked up with a really good thing. Tell us, Jesus, when you get into your kingdom, can we sit at your right and your left? And then Jesus asked them, who do people say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, Elijah. Others say that you were a prophet. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And it's Peter who responds and says, you are the Messiah. And then Jesus sternly orders them not to tell anyone. And then Jesus moves on to our passage today and begins to talk about the suffering he must undergo. And that's when Peter pulls Jesus aside. Come here, Jesus. And tells him, this is not the message that's going to make you, Jesus. And then that's when Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And if that's not enough, if you notice in the text, Jesus calls the crowd to come along with the disciples as he addresses them. And he says very clearly, if anyone wants to become my follower, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life must lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. What will it profit a person to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? If I'm in the crowd listening to Jesus and all the glory that I've encountered in his presence... I've probably been bragging about being around Jesus. You know, I've seen Jesus. I've seen Taylor Swift. You know, I, you know it's, I, I have something that you don't have, and I'm going to talk about it. And Jesus seems to say when we brag like things like that, it's a temptation from Satan, a temptation for a power that is not from God. And when I want the power of David to rise, of an earthly nation, so that I can brag, then Satan is the source 
of those temptations, Jesus seems to be saying. And the image of the cross in that culture is of a criminal who has been condemned and carries their cross outside of the city to be crucified. If I was a disciple, I would wonder, is Jesus calling us to be criminals? All those meals that we shared, all the laughter, all the love, it was so good. Jesus, you're messing it up. And then Jesus is someone who sits with sinners and he tells a man to take up his mat and walk on the Sabbath. Because Jesus' divine mission was to welcome and reconcile sinners, to encounter people on the margins, to love them and associate with them and ignore this societal stigmas associated with them. Jesus was on a mission of faithfulness to fulfill God's healing for all of creation. He was not going to dial down his ministry to spare his own life, nor did he expect his disciples to dial down their ministry either. He was not interested in the messianic title, but his life-giving mission. And then this great truth, only by giving ourselves to others. As Jesus gave himself for us, will we truly find ourselves. Jesus and following Jesus is not a lifestyle. It's a vocation. And we in our day and age must be so careful of the voices that proclaim Christ, a Christ that is only on one side, our side. If if Jesus were in our midst, would we be like Peter and pull Jesus aside and reprimand him and tell him to stop speaking of a life of sacrifice? Would you do that? Would I do that? Think of all the power that Satan seems to use these days to tempt people, tempted to demonize others. And then Jesus says you've got to be willing to die so that others might live. That's the call of Christ. What does that mean? Do we actually have to die? We might. We have to die, though, I know, to our opinions and our righteousness and our longing for power. And if this passage is not difficult enough, the Abrahamic covenant we read this morning in worship is very difficult, as you know. This covenant is the basis for fighting in the Middle East, even this very day. As Jeff Kennedy, and I asked him, said at Bible study this last Wednesday night, someone died this very day in Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, Egypt, because of this covenant between Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Ishmael. These are the promises that God made. Genesis 17, 8. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land where you are now on as an alien, all of the land of Canaan for a perpetual holding and will be their God. Genesis 17, 20. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will bless him and make him fruitful and exceedingly numerous. He shall be the father of 12 princes, and I will make him a great nation. And then Genesis 17, 21. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this season next year. What in the world did God mean in 10 with this covenant. When I struggle with that and the warring of nations, I love to skip to the Mosaic covenant in Exodus chapter 19, where God tells Moses that the people of Israel will be a light to the nation. I like that interpretation. And honestly, every Jewish friend, rabbi, synagogue I have ever associated with has brought me light and life. You know, it's been true for my Muslim friends as well. But what about all this fighting in the Middle East, not for just generations, but for centuries, fighting over 
the land because of a promise made. Seeking to have the power that enticed Peter. The history is so long and complicated. But I'd like to just show briefly a picture of the division of land since the establishment of the nation of modern-day Israel on May 4th, 1948. Some of you were alive. You can see the division in, on the left and how the land was being lived in, in those days before 1948. If any of you, I've had the privilege of being um, in Israel and being in some kibbutz and experienced kibbutzim, they were really all the way along up the coast and up in northern Galilee before the founding of Nation of Israel. Fascinating economic structures and people living in covenant community. With the division, with the nation of Israel comes the partition of the Israeli and the Palestinian land. The Palestinian land, as you can see, is green and Israel is white. There's another war, a season of war in 1967-68 and the, the boundaries are redrawn. And now you can see the boundaries where they are today. And I have not traveled since 1989. Some of you have, but there are walls everywhere. And when one looks at the progression of the lay of the land, one begins to see why there is so much fighting and so much violence. Is the modern day nation of Israel a fulfillment of the covenant with Abraham? It depends on who you talk to. And where is the promise fulfilled to Ishmael? The fight for the promised land, a nation in power goes on and on, and our hearts break at so many lives lost. When we think about land and how important it is, my ancestors made requests for land grants in the Oregon Territory and in the New Brunswick British Territories. Seven generations ago, Matthew and Samuel Canfield on my mother's side pursued a land grant with 15 other families in the late 1600s alongside the Wachung River. They asked Great Britain to settle something they wanted to call New Ark. They'd come from New Haven. It was too conservative. They wanted a new ark. And it became Newark, New Jersey. Of course, they had to negotiate with the Wachung Indians, which they did, trading insignificant items for that precious land. I've seen a handwritten list or a copy thereof. Land so important to my ancestors, middle-class working families, Germans, Scots, French. For you see, life and land meant income and well-being status and I sense their longing I know that longing for about 20 years my husband Dave and I and our family lived in church-owned property called manses or parsonages and I'll tell you it was the pits <laughs> we longed to own our own home to fix our own problems not to have to call on the building and grounds elder or the trustees for everything. And nothing was modern. Everything was old and used. I know this longing for land, to be in charge, to be powerful, to be able to rule your own house, to invite people in or keep them out. Does my land become a blessing to others? A sanctuary or is it just for me every day in ministry with you I am thinking about homes and housing for those in need in Clark County this last several weeks I was reminded about a new program called faith partners for housing Lynn Helmke has been a part of this Rhonda Peterson I didn't ask to use her name have been thinking about this, a home for everyone, where homes, where people share a space in their homes so that people can have a roof over their heads. A goal to provide housing for everyone. 
Is this wrong? Is it wrong for Jews to want a homeland? For Arabs, for young and old, for you and I? No, everyone deserves a home and a homeland. I've learned so much about Guatemala over the last several months, working with Sedepka, working with those who are indigenous, Guatemalans, so that they can support their families and stay home. But 36 years of civil war prompted by the greed of the United Fruit Company and a nation that will not be named decimated the infrastructures of that society. There is not even water infrastructures. That's why we're taking, we're, we're making and delivering water filters to families. So what does God desire? Jesus sits with sinners and tells the crowds, take up your cross and be willing to die so that others might live. This is sacrificial living. And when we see it, we know it is a powerful witness. Jesus wanted his disciples to see clearly what was going on, not be swept away by false stories and lifestyles, Jesus wanted and wants his disciples to hear the truth, the bold, life-changing truth about a love for the other. But it's so easy to cover our ears and close our eyes and talk nonsense so that we cannot hear the Savior calling. I pray that each one of us will all be open to Jesus' voice and stand faithfully in the ultimate covenant offered by God, his son, Jesus the Christ, who wants to walk with you in every corner of your life. Amen and amen. Amen, indeed. If you'd like to open your hymnals to sing page 361, Help from a Foundation, or the words are up here on the screen. I'm going to rely on your voices.